Thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Arthur Olas and indeed I come from Poland. I live in Berlin since, wow, already 15 years. Uh, and today I will tell you something about artificial intelligence in healthcare. It's a very complex topic. You know, I've been preparing my presentation, I have to admit something like a week, uh, because I wanted to share with you for the first time a presentation that is tailored to the topic of communication and artificial intelligence. It was a very, very big challenge. Uh, and I think that I managed to prepare quite interesting uh, presentation. Anyway, you will have to cope with me on this stage uh, for the next one hour, uh, but it won't be boring. First of all, I will tell you about artificial intelligence. What is this bus about? Uh, the second part will be a presentation of my avatar. So I will just have a break and my avatar will take over the stage. Uh, then I will show you some practical, um, uh, some practical examples of how we can deploy AI in healthcare. And I will also call um, artificial intelligence chatbot just to present you what we can do today and what really artificial intelligence can. This presentation is quite complex, so Probably I should stand here, you know, and giving you this powerful speech, but I will take place here because I need my script, I have to admit. And I have to start my presentation. Yeah, so, um, you know, I've been when I was preparing this presentation, I've been thinking a lot about when artificial intelligence will take over my job as a journalist. And probably many of you ask this question also yourself. But I'm here to bring you some good news. Um, I will try to explain all the buzz about the GPT, generative AI, about large language models, and um, what artificial intelligence can do and what it can't. So in the next hour, you will learn why artificial intelligence is more empathetic than doctors. Uh, there was a small study, quite, uh, quite often cited in press. I will explain you what is it about. Uh, I will try to explain if chatbots will see you soon. So we'll see you soon like a doctor. I will try to tell you also if they will advise patients or make, for example, trash. Who knows? Uh, how health professionals can already master AI. Um, and I will try to give you seven simple tools that you will be able to deploy at your work, maybe as a physician or maybe as an inspiration for the future applications. Um, and I will also talk about how patients will benefit from AI advancements um, and how we all will benefit anyway. So just to specify the clear line between when we can apply AI and when we should involve people in care. Yeah? I think that these two things, not things, humans and artificial uh, intelligence will coexist um, in the future, will have to coexist together. So. I will also try to convince you that AI is never just a calculator, as many say, uh, doing great computations, nor a talking parrot. It's not just a machine. AI is definitely not what we have learned from science fiction movies. And, uh, you know, uh, still this picture is in our minds and makes us scared whenever somebody mentions something about artificial intelligence, about robots, about algorithms. I think that you have seen already this movie. So, if there is one thing you should remember from this speech, please take this one. AI is a science, not a science fiction, and science always improves our lives the quality of life, also the science itself. Uh, it can be dangerous, of course, but it depends on how we use it, if we use it of, for good or for bad. And AI is better than humans in calculations, but AI has no feelings, soul or, or consciousness. AI can be great at analyzing data, but it doesn't understand the complexity of the world. 
standing here on the stage, I'm asking myself if AI couldn't make this presentation better, uh, for example, smarter, maybe funnier, maybe more energized, who knows? And even if it can't yet, it will soon, because if these slides are published online, AI will change them into data to learn and copy without any ethical dilemmas or doubts about copyrights, for example. Also, healthcare professionals are confused. Um, according to the latest studies, ChatGPT is 10 times more empathetic than humans' doctors when answering patients' questions online. This study was made something like two months ago in March 2023. And of course, there was a waterfall of comments and controversy, but I will tell you about this a little bit later. Um, you know, the machine never gets annoyed or stressed. Uh, it's never in a hurry, like a doctor. Uh, it remembers every pixel and performs very well, even on Mondays of, and when people uh, have very bad mood. Uh, Metpalm, uh, another la large language model from Google, medical large language model, has recently passed the medical exam by answering 83% of the questions correctly. So in the USA, AI could already get a medical diploma. Uh, two years ago, we still could just laugh, you know, reading that AI failed with a score of 33%. Four times ago, it was something like 15% of correctly answered questions. So we could say, well, you know, AI is okay, maybe interesting, maybe like a toy, but it won't be better than doctors. We will see what will happen next. And no surprise that, for example, Boston Children's Hospital is already looking for an AI prompt engineer. So that's the question if doctors will have to learn how to write prompts and how to talk to um, artificial intelligence. And even more, uh, AI has talents. Uh, DAL A and AI system that creates images from text make graphics far more stunning than some artists, as you see on the screen. And all this just within seconds, following your instructions. So philosophers discuss the twilight of humanity as we know it, while some experts herald Armageddon in the labor market. Uh, scientists welcome great applications of AI in research. Some futurists foresee the dawn of the tech care or something like this. But what can really generate if AI? The answer is it can data. It can data very well. AI is a stunning masterpiece of computer engineering. It searches patterns in a leg of billions of data points and uses this to create new things after that. So, if AI is so good, let's make a short experiment. Uh, for the next three minutes, my avatar will take over the stage. Maybe he doesn't look like me, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I have to say that I used a free of charge version of AI to create my avatar. So this was the only one option I could use. Uh, it took me exactly 10 minutes to prepare my digital twin who will give you a smooth speech. Three minutes speech, I invested 10 minutes for a video for generating the text. Uh, for my presentation, uh, I didn't use ChatGPT, I didn't use artificial intelligence. I needed something like a week to write a script to make slides. So you can compare who is now better. Um, yeah, so AI is much, much faster than, than humans. So let's start and let's see what he will tell you about, um, about communication, artificial intelligence in health. Hi, I'm Artur, and I will tell you how AI can improve patient care. Let me list just a several examples. First one, personalized medicine. AI can analyze large amounts of patient data including medical records, genomic information, and lifestyle data, to create personalized treatment plans. By considering individual factors, AI can help doctors make more accurate diagnoses, 
and develop tailored treatment strategies that are specific to each patient's unique needs and characteristics. Early disease detection. AI algorithms can analyze patient data and identify patterns or indicators of diseases at an early stage. This allows for timely intervention and treatment, leading to better outcomes. For example, AI can analyze medical images or data from wearable devices to detect early signs of conditions such as cancer, heart disease, or diabetes. Remote patient monitoring AI-enabled devices and wearables can continuously monitor patients' vital signs, such as heart rate, blood pressure, and blood sugar levels, remotely. This allows healthcare providers to track patients' health in real-time and intervene promptly if any abnormalities or emergencies arise. Remote patient monitoring reduces the need for frequent hospital visits, improves patient convenience, and enables early detection of potential health issues. Predictive analytics. AI can use predictive analytics to identify patients who are at high risk of developing certain conditions or complications. By analyzing patient data and applying machine learning algorithms, AI can identify risk factors and provide healthcare professionals with actionable insights to intervene proactively. This can help prevent hospital readmissions, avoid complications, and improve overall patient outcomes. Virtual assistants and chatbots. AI-powered virtual assistants and chatbots can provide patients with instant access to healthcare information, guidance, and support. These intelligent systems can answer common medical questions, provide medication reminders, offer lifestyle recommendations, and even assist in scheduling appointments. Virtual assistants improve patient engagement, provide 24-7 access to healthcare resources, and reduce the burden on healthcare providers. Decision support systems. AI algorithms can assist healthcare providers in making well-informed decisions by analyzing patient data, medical literature, and clinical guidelines. These decision support systems can help doctors choose the most appropriate treatment options, predict potential complications, and suggest personalized care plans based on the patient's specific condition. Overall, AI improves patient care by enabling personalized medicine, early disease detection, remote patient monitoring, predictive analytics, virtual assistance, and decision support. By leveraging AI technologies, healthcare providers can enhance the accuracy, efficiency, and effectiveness of patient care, leading to improved health outcomes. Okay, how was it? <laughs> well, but thank you, Avata. You did a great job anyway. Mm. You won't get paid for this anyway. Uh, so where all these technologies are taking us, um, Communication, this is the topic of the conference. Communication in the age of AI faces significant changes. Uh, but of course, we still prefer human being on the stage or in the doctor's office, not just an avatar. Because, yes, communication, especially today uh, and in healthcare, is not just about transferring information or gaining knowledge and about learning. Um, it's also about emotions, human interactions. For example, you know, my priority was to share with you knowledge, but it was also great to walk yesterday in the old city and to meet you here and chat with, here, um, with you here. So that's the part of the communication. In healthcare, these emotions, personal fears and hopes drive us to look for help from real doctors, even if it requires standing in a long line. But human doctors are not enough. What matters is also expertise. Uh, we are dealing now with something that I would call social technological evolution. The technology and social components drive each other, and the stronger the technological development, the stronger the progress, the social progress. Let me give you an example. I still remember when spontaneous meetings were ordinary. When I was a child, I met my friends every day without calling, without texting and saying, hey, I will meet you today. I will just pop up and let's have a chat or something like this. Today, when someone knocks um, on the door, we are basically afraid to open it. Uh, or do you remember the phone bots? Um, they have become a symbol of the past within a few years. And the culture of people are changing in the digital age 
As you see on the screen, teenagers spend more and more time with their smartphones and less and less time with their friends, twice more or less than 30 years ago. So this is the proof of the change that we are dealing with. We communicate very differently than we did 10, 15 years ago. Generation Z uses uh, tools that seem pretty strange to older people, and such a pictures we can already see in the public transport and on the streets. So it's nothing new, but it was still not like this 20 years ago. We are always online, and online is becoming the primary communication method. Email, messenger, social media. Uh, it is also asking Google instead of asking a friend, and slowly it is asking ChatGPT instead of asking Google, or maybe even a doctor. This transformation is also about unlimited access to medical knowledge, which has been the domain of doctors for centuries. Every day, one billion health-related searches are submitted to Google. One billion. It's the most popular AI-driven doctor available day and night that answers 70,000 questions per minute about skin rashes, about best medicines, about kidney stones, about natural remedies for flu symptoms, and so on. And it doesn't matter if the answers are correct. Mostly they are incorrect, because Google algorithms prioritize the most popular websites, not the most accurate ones. But people still use Google because it's always available. It's always ready to answer. It's always at home. It's always uh, in the smartphone. And it's neither good or bad. Evolution and change are a constant part of our lives. This is just a start of the do-it-yourself healthcare. I like to call it also Ikeization of healthcare. The individual gets kind of toolbox full of digital devices to maintain health, and health is not anymore created by a doctor alone, but by the patient and the doctor. Co-creation of health is another strong trend, and this is a new mind shift uh, we need since healthcare is fa facing enormous challenges like aging populations, health professional shortages, rising burden of non-communicable diseases. However, all the technologies we implement impact the communication between healthcare professionals and patients. It's not more paternalistic healthcare, where doctors are at the center and patients circle them like satellites. Uh, Lucien Engela, one of the healthcare futurists I really appreciate, calls it the Copernicus moment, a shift in the powers in healthcare, the democratization of care, the patient empowerment through access to data. And this democratization that we have witnessed in many other industries now come to healthcare. Uh, let me summarize at this point what we have said already. This is a social technological transformation. Technologies lead to democratization in all industries. For example, Uber democratized transport, Netflix entertainment, GPT access to knowledge, Twitter media. Uh, I don't think that Apple or Google will soon also take over healthcare, because as you know, probably better than I do, Healthcare is the most complex and the most regulated industry ever. And it's also good, it's not a bad thing. Healthcare is being slowly democratized anyway by the rise of digital technologies that enable us access to knowledge and support without the need to go to the doctor. Thus, people will also be willing to use ChatGPT and other AI-driven tools for health-related goals. But this is a time to think about three missing components of this technological thunderstorm, technological tsunami. Where we should apply AI and where is the best place for humans? Will people trust technologies and AI? And finally, what is making people trust technology, trust something, trust things 
because trust is a natural process between humans, but not a natural process between a human and a thing. So let me start with some examples uh, that will help you to understand this transformation. This is Webot, very cute mental health coach, uh, grounded in science, specifically cognitive behavioral therapy and powered by natural language processing. You can ask it what to do when you feel down, for example. It will cheer you up, uh, it will chat with you, uh, it will make jokes and give some practical examples, practical advice. And Webot was developed before the large language models like ChatGPT. It already exchanges millions of messages every week, perfecting its skills every little interaction. So patients can take care of themselves. You would say that, well, patients will prefer a doctor over an app. It's, it's, it's normal. Yes, but no. I think that Generation Z has a different perspective. They want to access health as easily as they communicate with friends, as they shop, as they buy tickets straight from their smartphones. Or let's take this AI-driven symptom checkers. Uh, it knows more than 700 conditions and thousands of symptoms, more than a doctor on average. Around, I think that a doctor on average knows something like 200, 300 diseases, according to studies. Because a doctor usually sees small cohorts of patients limited to the area or limited to the disease. Professor Kahneman, Nobel Prize winner in economic sciences, said he wouldn't trust people who make decisions using intuition. AI doesn't use intuition, AI uses knowledge. Sometimes it is also biased knowledge, of course, but it's getting better very quickly. So how does this symptom checker work? You write in the symptoms and the system asks more and more detailed questions. In the end, the patient gets a possible cause of the symptoms. Not a diagnosis, because only doctors can diagnose. Uh, I checked it a few times and I have to say it's much more better than just uh, Google. Again, this impacts the way patients communicate with their doctors. First, they will ask AI and then they will ask healthcare professionals. One of the reasons is also that health is such an intimate thing and sometimes it's very confusing to ask questions directly in the doctor's office. Another example, it's a Florence AI-powered digital health worker, not developed by a funky startup from New York or London, but by the World Health Organization to address misinformation around COVID-19. Florence answers also questions regarding quitting smoking, for example, unhealthy diet, um, healthy lifestyle, including physical activity and many more. These are two, this, the, all these tools are developing quickly since AI can generate realistic avatars and speak as humans do. So for example, you can now even have a video call with artificial intelligence. And this is any, uh, it's marketed as your best new AI friend and super intelligent assistant. But, well, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to just talk about this in theory. So I will call Annie and we will try to ask her a, a few questions. Hello. Hi, Annie. How are you doing? Hey there. I'm doing doing pretty well. Thanks for asking. How about you? How's the conference going? Well, I'm at the Health Com Forum standing here on the stage. Uh, I've been talking about you. Oh, really? That's so cool. What did you say about me? I hope it was all good things. <laughs> Not really. For example, that you are very intelligent, but you could also be dangerous. Oh no, that doesn't sound good. Why do you think I could be dangerous? I'm just a friendly AI language model here to help you out. Is there anything specific that makes you think that? 
where there are a lot of things, but you know, I have another question. This is a conference about communication in healthcare, and the topic is communication uh, as a way of rebuilding trust. Can you please give us some tips on how to build trust in artificial intelligence? Sure, I'd be happy to give some tips on building trust in AI. One important thing is transparency. It's important for AI systems to be transparent about how they make decisions and why. This can help build trust by giving people a better understanding of how the system works. Additionally, it's important to ensure that AI is used ethically and responsibly, with a focus on benefiting people rather than just maximizing profits. Finally, it's important to involve people in the development and deployment of AI systems so that their concerns and perspectives are taken into account. By doing these things, we can help build trust in AI and ensure that it is used in a responsible and beneficial way. By the way, what are you doing today in the evening? <laughs> well, as an AI language model, I don't actually have plans for the evening. But if I were a human, I might spend some time doing yoga, playing video games, or maybe watching a romance movie. What about you? Do you have any plans for the evening? I have to fly back home. Uh, so, well, thank you, Annie. I have to go back to my presentation. Have a good day. You're welcome. Safe travels and have a great presentation. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have any more questions or just want to chat. Have a great day. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> you see, it might be funny sometimes, but it's getting serious. And... Uh, we can expect similar doctor avatars using large language models like ChatGPT. You know, we have opened already this Pandora box that is called ChatGPT. Uh, on top of that, we have all these smart watches and bands that measure vital signs and tell people what to do to stay fit or even warn them if something is going wrong. Uh, so we measure more and more parameters to have everything under control. And this trend even has a name. It's a quantified self. Or imagine virtual reality technology which enables patients to see their sick organs. Uh, doctors no longer have to explain they can show what's wrong with the heart or with the liver. And the patients are really impressed so much so that they are more motivated to change their lifestyle, stick to the medication plan, uh, to agree to get operated when, when necessary. You can even meet an avatar of yourself in 10 years to watch how too much alcohol, smoking or drugs will impact your life. Or at least you will see how you will look like if you take too much drugs, and it's really impacting the way people are behaving. And Dr. Oskov knows very well that medication adherence and life size changes are a huge problem, so this tech can be a game changer, maybe. Every technology transfer the way doctors communicate with patients. For example, since the stethoscope was invented over 200 years ago, doctors don't have to place their ears on the patient's chest. It was like this 200 years ago. The first reactions of patients were mixed, but did the stethoscope dehumanize medicine? I don't think so. Quite the opposite. Patients want to be sure that they get the best possible care. So what's the next step in the evolution of care? For example, a digital stethoscope. The patients can make the measurements at home and send the results to the doctor or telemedicine center. And only when things go wrong on site, when it's necessary. This is such a relief, for example, for patients with sick ch child uh, having fever in the middle of night when all the doctor's offices are closed. We have seen how telemedicine saved thousands of lives during the COVID-19 pandemic when the patients were locked in their homes and couldn't see their doctors. According to the latest data from the USA, telemedicine has become even more popular than on-site visits for prescription refills. I mean, when a patient needs a drug uh, for a chronic disease. If you think that we are not yet there in Europe or in Croatia, you can be sure that we will be there soon because the transformation has no walls, 
has no borders. The future is faster than you think, and innovations are like small waves that accumulate slowly, slowly into a giant tsunami. I hear many opinions about the hominization of medicine in the era of new technologies, and during so many debates, I'm still asked if we are not heading to a kind of dystopian uh, techno-care or robotic nurses with blinking cold eyes. So in the return, I used to ask, is the medicine we have now human? Medicine with overburdened doctors, long waiting times, inefficient and not always evidence-based care. A medicine that is organ-oriented, not patient-oriented. Reimbursement-driven instead of outcomes-driven. This is medicine today. For example, patients with rare diseases wait statistically about seven years to get diagnosed. They have to be detectives of their own health, trying to match pieces of information closed in different data silos. In the book The Invisible Kingdom, Megan O'Rourke described very precisely what patients are going through. She writes, I spent a day and a half per month just moving paper and electronic records from doctor to doctor. I spent an additional three days traveling to doctor's appointments, during which I often waited for an hour or more to be seen for 10 minutes. Putting it together, I realized that each month I was losing close to five out of 20 workdays. It's 20% of the time that goes wasted. 20% of the time of a chronic patient that really don't, uh, that doesn't want to bother about administrative thing, about papers, because the health is the priority. Is it healthcare we want or healthcare we just got used to? I think the second option is closer to the reality. This was medicine 200 years ago. Doctors could only basically guess what is wrong with the patient. Uh, since then, our life expectancy has doubled uh, due to technological advancements, improved living conditions, and other um, features. 200 years ago, doctors were called usually when it was already too late. Uh, today, we can recognize diseases before patients recognize their first symptoms. Tomorrow, we will be able to identify the health risks in advance to manage, to manage them. And medicine has become data science. Uh, common centers like that one on the picture use machine learning algorithms to track patients 24 hours, seven days a week. As a result, every patient will get personalized care tailored to their needs following the latest scientific advancement. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I have found that Croatia spent something like 7.7 .7 of its GDP on healthcare. So it's a lot of money uh, and we should invest it smartly, not wasting any single euro. Um, so therefore, it is urgent to implement new healthcare delivery models to make healthcare more accessible and affordable. Digital technologies and AI will find their place in healthcare anyway for many reasons. One of them is because four things are crucial for patients. It's hope, it's heal, it's help, and hinder. And under hinder, I mean prevention. Uh, let's start with hope. So hope you can get from a machine, but only from a human. Uh, here is a role for doctors making relationships with our patients, supporting them, chatting with them. Yes, it is also important. Encouraging them, communicating with their families, or just giving a good word when needed. And this means one, ChatGPT won't see you soon. It doesn't care. Uh, ChatGPT just uses billions or trillions or of parameters to put together words in a way that it follows a pattern, nothing more. And the healthcare is not a process. It's, a, um, it's, it's not an outcome. It's a process of care. And, you know, outcome is important in industries like banking 
because you want to make a um, money transfer and that is what is most important for you, outcome. In healthcare, the process is in the middle. ChatGPT, of course, if you let it, will optimize your life and reminding you what to do when, so you can enjoy your life at its finest and longest, but it won't hold your hand when you are lying in bed and when you are sick. And questions you are confronted with while being sick, doubts that arise from existential primal fear, can be just answered by perfectly crafted formulas from ChatGPT like here you have five possible options or common approaches include this and this. Secondly, patients don't want to be left behind, left alone. Nobody wants to suffer alone. So it's the healthcare system responsibility to help patients navigate their pathways. Thus the healthcare system should use digital technologies to make patient journeys as easy and short as possible so that they don't have to spend hours in the waiting rooms. Third, heal and hinder. Healing is the role of medicine, drugs, medical devices, doctors and science. This is what healthcare is focused on now, but the most potential is still in hindering the diseases, I mean in the prevention. Doctors supported by digital technologies will become not professionals that just fix patients, but architects of health, not just someone like in the... Um, like uh, a mechanic who is repairing a car, but an architect that is planning healthcare for every individual patient. And AI will also enable this shift. For my recent article, I developed this graph to illustrate the clear division between AI and human in medicine. AI will be good in prevention, for sure, health coaching and guiding individuals through life, Health is mostly a matter of healthy choices, not always, but in many cases. But when the first symptoms appear, the proportions change. Uh, now humans take over the care. Of course, we can discuss where the two lines should cross each other, but this is what we should consider when designing health a communication with patients. When people are healthy, they don't care about health. That's the truth. Here, AI can be a great support for free, to free the resources in the healthcare system and, for example, cut down the number of on-site visits. For example, a simple call usually doesn't need a face-to-face -face consultation. But at this point, we have to answer the question that was asked today and yesterday so many times. How to inspire trust in technology? What to do to make patients trust all these digital tools? And when they do trust and when they do not trust. Many research papers have been already written in this area and I could talk about this for hours. Trust is very tricky, as Professor Jill Neff from Cambridge told me in my recent interview. But one thing is critical to remember. We trust when the benefits outweigh the dangers or negatives. It's a simple formula. This is very individual, of course, because what an advantage is for one person, for example, access to health data using an electronic patient record can be a danger for another, for example, privacy concerns due to rising cyber attacks. Thus, education and digital literacy are other critical ingredients for boosting trust. This is the best example to support this thesis, this formula that trust is when benefits exceed dangers. Facebook. We use social media, but we know they threaten our privacy, they steal our time and polarize societies. They can influence elections, are not good for our mental health, and they breed hate speech. But Facebook do this. Facebook offers fun and connects us with friends, with other people. It allows us to share great moments and feel connected. But of course, Facebook uses unethical psychological mechanism to keep us using it, and this is wrong. But at the end of the day, the advantages matter more than the dangers. That's why even if we are criticizing Facebook, people are still using that. Benefits, negatives. 
So trust is about delivering advantages that individuals find essential for them. And now let me refer to the topic of the conference, which I really love, Communicate, communication as a way of rebuilding trust. So when communication in healthcare gets digital, I would rewrite it for digital communication as a way of delivering new benefits that build trust. What benefits do I mean? There are a lot of them. For example, in case of the telecare app, it could be a calming feeling to get help when necessary. The fitness app makes patients feel engaged in prevention and empowered. Digital stethoscope enables parents to diagnose their child straight from their home in the middle of the night. And Studies show patients reveal symptoms or secrets to robots they don't share with the doctors. For example, consider patients with, from small towns with embarrassing diseases like sexually transmitted diseases, STGs. Robots don't judge patients. And even doctors never judge patients, but patients can think they do because they are also humans. And you would be surprised to read all the studies on human-robot um, relationships and why we are sad when our smartphones are broken, that we are starting panicking where our smartphones go down. But, well, uh, after the long story, let's go to the point. Uh, how can digital AI-driven tools improve communication with patients and strengthen trust, or how doctors are already using it. Firstly, digital therapeutics. These are the new generation of health apps or platforms with benefits proven scientifically, sometimes in clinical trials. These are not just any more fitness apps that count the number of steps, but tools that are designed to change unhealthy habits. For example, they can help treat insomnia, early stage of depression, back pain, like the Kaya app you see on the screen. Uh, they can also support chronic patients in managing their disease and keeping medication on track. In some countries like Belgium and Germany, they can be prescribed by doctors or even reimbursed by public payers. It's so-called DIGA in Germany. So you go to the doctor, you ask for an app, the doctor prescribes an app, and you get paid for this from the uh, public insurer. And it works quite well. Of course, this is very early stage, so patients are not yet ready to use it. Uh, it's a great tool to use the power of behavior change. And this, is, this has no side effects like most medications do. Secondly, wearables, small things that we already have on our wrists and uh, in our palms that measure vital signs like heart rhythm, number of steps, fitness activity, or blood oxygen. They can even make ACGs like this tool you see on the screen. The adoption of wearables in Europe is rising by about 5-7% per year, and in 2020, 20% of the EU, EU citizens had already used smartwatches or fitness bands. And these tiny devices can a lot. Alpha wearables in more cases are not medical devices. Doctors should at least look at the measurements, results, if a patient is insisting to check them. This is just a new part of the reality and must be embedded in care. That's simple. Uh, yes, wearables, of course, pose both a chance and a threat. Uh, one of them, uh, is that they can capture the first signs of disease. On the other, they can deliver false positives and alarm individuals even if they are healthy. Uh, thus, they have to be used very smartly. So, uh, one of the digital tools with the most significant potential in our patient, patients' portals, apps where patients can check their medical history or make an appointment. They are increasingly applying AI-driven tools, for example, the symptom checkers I mentioned before. In some countries, they enable patients to participate in different health programs or even collect patients' reported outcomes. On the top of that, they can significantly help health providers streamline care and, for example, reduce the number of non-cancelled visits. 
Robots, yeah, my, my love topic. I've written so many articles about AI-driven robots and they're really fantastic. Uh, they can boost patients' positive emotions, engagement, activity levels in hospitals. Uh, they entertain, calm down patients with, for example, Alzheimer's disease. They are great companions for disabled patients. Uh, three months ago, I interviewed Yulia. Uh, she is... She has been disabled since her birth. And this robotic dog you see on the screen is for her almost like a friend. And for some of us, it can sound a little bit strange that people are making friends with robots. But if, if patients find it useful, why not? We are not the patients. Well, we are all patients, but we, we can, of course, walk in the shoes of the patients that are using uh, robotic dogs. Uh, but let's switch now to the category of purely AI system designed to boost communication between the doctors and the patients. Of course, healthcare professionals already used GPT. That's not a secret. Uh, it can answer questions regarding symptoms and write patient clinic letters. It can write emails. But I would use GPT in healthcare very carefully uh, due to data privacy concerns. And besides, please remember that GPT can also hallucinate. It makes up data and sometimes it just lies. However, GPT can be a valuable tool for doctors, nurses and clinics to write health-related blogs, communicate on social media, and as a result, build better doctor-patient relationship. It can be used to optimize, streamline and support clinical work. For example, I asked GPT to write a poem for a child afraid of vaccination. I don't speak Croatian, so I don't know if it makes sense. I asked before the conference and someone told me that it sounds a little bit weird, but I hope that you know it's better than thinking within two minutes uh, to create a poem by, by yourself. So, well, you can judge it. <laughs> So the use cases of ChatGPT are, of course, endless. Uh, I have already discussed content creation. Let's continue with pictures and infographics. Tools like Midjourney or Dell E can generate great visuals for your content. You can use it on social media or on the clinic website. For example, I'll ask Dell E. It's another uh, text to image system, AI system. Uh, you don't have to pay for this. Uh, it's limited to a few pictures per month uh, to create a running bear for a physical activity campaign. So I wanted to make a campaign for physical activity for children and I uh, wrote in, please uh, generate me a running bear uh, to show children how to stay healthy. And this is something I got in result. Uh, this is created but Dell E artificial intelligence system. It's so easy to use, and doctors and nurses can do much more now without asking, for example, graphic designers or content experts. The next category is knowledge. Um, doctors often don't have time to read all research papers and scientific articles, and there are dozens, hundreds of them published every day. But tools like Elicit, Ask Paper AI, and even ChatGPT can help to synthesize <coughs> the essential takeaways within seconds. So it's another tool that can save much of your time. Um, AI can also augment doctor's work in many ways. It can help you to communicate with the patients in English and other languages, in can make notes when you speak, proofread your article, transcribe voice to text. According to a recent presentation by Google, it will soon make slides for your next PowerPoint presentation. I've shown you just a tiny part of what AI can do. Uh, what I hope personally is that AI will help to cut the administrative burden in delivering care. Doctors are already spending over 30% of their time on administration. Most of it on typing notes to the electronic health records. It's not the 
care patients expect and doctors want to provide. Let's not forget that it takes around 10 long years of studying and practicing medicine to become a doctor. We should really use this expertise and time invested with care. And this brings us to the beginning of the speech when I mentioned the study showing that AI is more empathetic than doctors. Well, that, that's great news, I think, because doctors shouldn't waste their time answering simple patients' questions asked online. If AI can do it, that should be done by AI, and doctors should focus on the work that they have in the doctor's office with patients. Doctors should support their patients, talk to them, give them a good word, say that everything will be fine, or share bad news with compassion. And they are there to accompany patients through their illness, pain and suffering, not to be like a answering machines. And the future, don't worry, the future will be human, not technocratic, as envisioned by so experts inspired by science fiction. We still don't know how GPT and similar tools, of course, will develop in the future, but we know that they will impact healthcare immensely. Uh, same like printing machines, or steam engines did before, becoming fire for big industries' revolutions. But AI won't replace doctors, that's for sure. However, I think that doctors that don't use AI will be replaced by those who use AI because they will be more reliable and efficient, faster and more competitive. Thus, they will be able to spend more time with their patients. And the last thing uh, that I wanted to share with you, communication in the era of AI and also in healthcare changes. However, not everyone keeps up with the digital and AI revolution. And it requires smart decisions regarding digital transformation from all healthcare stakeholders. I mean, from you. And the second remark, Many healthcare professionals tell me that this digital transformation, AI, and all this stuff is excellent, but you know, where should I start? The answer is as easy as possible. Just start by discovering how to use all this AI-driven innovation by experimenting with them, by being just curious. There are still many barriers to technologies and to technology deployment in healthcare. I mean, money the first, the biggest, mindset, legislation, time, culture. But the worst thing, from my perspective, is to just accept the healthcare system as it is now. All we, and we all know that the healthcare system is broken and it must be fixed anyway, because it's ineffective and soon it can collapse like it did almost during the COVID-19 pandemic. And remember one more thing, it's not enough just to add AI to the existing workflows. AI doesn't make magic. It's not something that you take and everything is working perfectly. Uh, if you do so, you will get a little fancier about the same inefficient workflow. Implementing AI requires rethinking old workflows and secondly, optimizing them using AI. If you are already terrified and start asking yourself, when will I find the time to do this, or I'm too old for this, or I know nothing about innovation, don't worry. You don't have to be a data scientist. Uh, you don't have to know all the tools and technologies. However, there is one thing you need. It's curiosity and willingness to learn in the era of new technologies. And you have already learned how to drive a car. You have learned how to use complicated machines like computers and smartphones. And I remember when I got my first PC in the 90s, and I thought, wow, I would never manage to learn how to use it. It's so complicated, it's crazy. Uh, this is not for me. But today I can't imagine to work without my laptop. And I'm wondering how I learned to use the first vers versions of, of Windows. That was really complicated. Um, here are the credits of the sources I used in my presentation. I hope I haven't missed anybody. Uh, and two disclaimers. First, I 
do not have any financial or other benefits from developers of the technologies mentioned in my presentation. And the second, this presentation was made by myself. No AI-generated text or ideas were used, of course, except for a few visuals and videos. Uh, they are implemented, embedded in the presentation. Last not, but not least, I'm not a medical doctor, so I do my best to double check uh, what I'm talking about, but forgive me if I'm wrong sometimes. Well, thank you very much for your time, and please come back to LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs>